Um, so I'm Dr. Shakuntala Banaji and I work at the Department of Media and Communications at LSE. It's probably better to start by saying study of audiences was the beginning of my research. So I was completely fascinated by audiences. Audiences together, en masse, in large groups, audiences in little groups, and then audiences as they dispersed and became individual viewers but still felt part of a, an audience. And so when I started off doing audience research in 1999, what I was looking at was the move from cinema-based viewing to DVD and video-based viewing in the home. And I thought it would be a quite straightforward process of setting up um, some kind of um, observations and interviews with groups of people who self-identified as audiences. But as I got um, a little bit deeper into the research and I watched audiences and watched audiences watching each other and watching the same film multiple times, I realized that in the interviews, what I was collecting was a snapshot of an audience member describing a particular experience of viewing. And so audiences behave hugely differently when they're with different people. So you put, a, an, let's, let's say you put an audience of men watching a Hindi film in which there's a pornographic sequence into a room with lots and lots of women, older women, and they'll behave entirely differently so watching audience behavior and describing audience behavior is also a completely fascinating, fascinating thing. So I went from working with um, large audiences of Hindi films and I've watched audiences in cinemas where there are more than 1,000 people and I've spent three hours consecutively, three times in a day <laughs> for, for about five weeks watching the same film with different audiences, watching the same people coming back to different shows with different groups of friends, and their behavior changed. And then in their recounting of the experience of viewing, their understanding of the moment of viewing also changed, and their understanding of the meaning of the text also changed. So I, I got a profound sense of the complexity of texts and moments in text from that work. Over the years, I've worked on internet audiences who are entirely dispersed first, and then come together. I've just come back from a trip to India where people make a date to watch a particular satirical comedy show online, even though it's aired weeks ago, but they'll make a date to come together and sit and watch it, even though they've all watched it separately. They'll make times when something is live broadcasting online to come and sit together and watch it. So you've got people constituting themselves as audiences rather than the text constituting them as audiences because they're friendship groups that love watching things together and find it really interesting or their families. So that movement from a group to an individual back into a group again, I think is something which is which we thought wasn't going to happen with the internet and is happening. So I'm totally fascinated by that. The work of Martin Barker around discursive formations, the work of people like Janet Steger in the same area, and um, lovely work in India, which probably, I, I don't know if you know, but Farid Kazmi, who's done a lot of work on the Indian audience, who uses a modified form of theories of hegemony to understand what's going on at the moment at which an audience encounters a film. I think for me, although those were textual theories, they have proved really, really fruitful in understanding what's going on when audiences explain what they're doing. If I were to move into cultural studies, I would say your work and David Buckingham's work, which doesn't naively celebrate the notion of activity, but actually interrogates the, the question of what, of what does activity consist. And so you can't exactly call those theories of active audiences, but theories which investigate how meaning and activeness or action are interlinked, I think, are very useful. Of course, sometimes I do call on really quite old theories, and I might even, dare I say it, use an effects theory or two in my work. I might use a uses and gratifications theory in my work. But I do that always supplemented by ideas about negotiation, and that comes from the work of a load of feminist theorists, Christine Gledhill primarily, and the notion that everything is negotiated. Um, I've just marked a dissertation where somebody uses Stuart Hall 
and encoding decoding in a really new and fresh way and I liked it enormously. They did so in a way which incorporates the idea of negotiation which Stuart Hall didn't incorporate but I think making encoding and decoding more flexible is a really helpful thing to do with audiences. Now how does that help us to define what an audience is? I think that's really problematic but I'll take it to a theoretical end and say that I've been working on the notion of the public and I work a lot on publics because I'm looking at political publics and how people are mobilized into particular political formations and I think that the distinction between audience and public is still a really relevant and interesting one and so I think a more interesting question than how do you define an audience is when does an audience define itself as a public or as an audience and what makes a group of viewers define themselves as an audience would be a question I'd be really interested in. So audiences as groups are gullible and media savvy because they live in a particular context where the context has alerted them to something that might be false or problematic, but it has also, um, in a way, inured them to false and problematic things, which are discourses in their everyday life, which they don't then question. So, for instance, adult audiences seem to believe that they're always going to be more critical than child audiences. Let's just take this view. And you sit child audiences and adult audiences down in what's known as a family film or a, a romantic comedy, and you'll find the child audiences making far more sharp, perceptive comments and actually quite poignant comments about the representation of children where adults simply mm. swallow those representations of, as if they're unproblematic. And the adults, of course, are very alert to things like brand, brand management and the insertion of brands into films. And the children are not really that interested because they don't have the money for it. But the adults are worried that the children are getting influenced by that. So audiences are both extremely savvy about some things, mm -hmm. but also extremely vulnerable to influence in areas where their own lives ideologically lead them to a set of beliefs. And I would, I would include myself in that, in that... For instance, I'll give you an example, watching one of Michael Moore's documentaries years ago. Um, I was, you know, I was swept along with the, with the emotions, with the visual juxtapositions and with the group of people I was watching with, all anti-capitalists. And yet, when you look at what evidence he presents, it's a narrative. It's a narrative, it's emotional. There are jump cuts which are visually stunning but logically problematic. Um, you know, maybe you emotionally identify with the argument, but it actually prevents you from having a sense of what's difficult or troubling about that. And so over the years, I think I've learned to see audiences as all of them, all of us, both incredibly vulnerable and more so at particular points in history, but also more and more technologically savvy. Audiences are changing. The, the audience may be dead, but audiences are very much alive and kicking. Uh, as I said um, previously, I think audiences are constituting themselves more than they used to. So rather than being called into being because there's a space in which you become an audience and then disperse, people are creating spaces where they can be audiences they're also um, creating spaces virtually where they acknowledge themselves as audiences or they out themselves as audiences and equally where they understand that they are being watched by an audience. So for instance, in the Chinese um, online serial and soap sphere where there is a competitive subtitling going on, groups of people are watching other groups of people and watching the screen and they are interacting with subtitlers as part of the experience of watching that. Gamers are watching the game together, they're developing it together, they're also watching fellow players and knocking fellow players out and, you know, sort of outing fellow players as this, that and the other. So there's an there's a intersection of being part of an audience and being part of the spectacle. And I think that's the other interesting thing about the internet and how it enables an audience to construct itself either as an audience or as part of the spectacle or as both at any given moment. But the idea that traditional audiences are dead is completely absurd. If you look at sport and sporting events, if you look at the number of people that tune into um, Great British Bake Off at any given moment and the kinds of 
live commentaries going on on Snapchat and Instagram while Great British Bake Off is going on, you would be hard pressed to say that these people were not an audience. And the moments, the great moments of tears, the great moments of fear, the moment when Trump was elected and everybody was watching, you can't say that this isn't a traditional audience. It absolutely is. Um, I don't think I can satisfy anyone in this answer um, because actually I find that lots of different methods of audience research are productive. And if you happen to have the personnel capacity and the capital capacity, deploying multiple audience research methods together is the most productive way of going in terms of understanding meaning and understanding audiences that you can get. And I'll give you an example. So my absolute favorite pieces of research include wide surveys, which are very open-ended and have got plenty of space both for quantitative and qualitative comments. They include in-depth interviews with a subset of the people that took the wide survey. They include um, observations of the sorts of people that took the survey, but also of subsets and subgroups within that when they are in different spaces. So, for instance, of parents separately and children separately, of men and women separately, of different ethnic and sexual orientations. And I think that kind of audience research, there's a beautiful study um, by Prieto Iglesias of a single film in which she interviews different sexual orientation groups separately and she asks questions about sex and sexuality and gender on screen and the answers in the focus groups are so different depending on what gender the people are in the room and what their sexual orientation is, how they read the film, how they understand the script. And she deploys this in a very, very organized, almost systematic, almost um, quantitative manner. And she's done maybe 48 uh, of these um, focus groups. And it's fa really fascinating. Same film, it's almost like different films, 20 different films, you know, seen by different people. Central character loved, central character despised. Central character seen as a, you know, a shining beacon of women's liberation. Central character seen as um, capitalist whiteness. And, you know, it's, it's really, really amazing to watch that. So bringing together these various different methods, particularly for me, interviewing observation and large scale surveys, um, gives you a unique insight into moments when there are ruptures between different members of the audience over meaning. Um, it gives you a unique insight into the things that quantitative research cannot tell you. And there's, a, there's an awful lot that it can't, but there's an awful lot that it can and it can validate it in a way which is very satisfying. And not that satisfaction should be the end goal of, of methodology and audience research, but I think if you get a feeling of something from a qualitative interview and then you confirm that feeling through a large quantitative survey or you want to know more through a large quantitative survey and then you confirm that through interviews or you nuance it through interviews, that's the most useful and constructive method. Nasty audiences. I think is a huge, huge challenge. It's already, it's, it's not coming, it's come, it's here. And I don't think any of us really quite know what to do about it. Um, I've just been reading a book by a, a feminist theorist in the US called The Internet of Garbage, which she now, in talking about it, updates and says I should have called The Internet of Garbage and Fake News but fake news. And she then goes on to define how garbage is spam, it's trolling, it's flaming, it's, it's you know, doxing. There's a whole range of things. And I think um, when we interact with people as rational researchers, we always, even, even when we go undercover in far-right groups, we always act as if there is some core good thing or good value that we share with these people that we want to understand that we're trying to get to the heart of. Now, I've been studying the, um, the Hindu far right in India and the ways in which they troll dissenting critical political voices, feminist activists, young women, you know, anyone, anyone and anything that gets in their way and the way in which they destroy them. And there is, there is no getting to the core, heart, good values, commonality with these audiences. 
And similarly, with these extremely aggressive incels and misogynistic far-right men in the US who are trolling women professors for the kinds of things they say and do with students, you are not going to build bridges. So Holstein and Gubrium's lovely notion of active interviewing, which I have deployed time and time again successfully with young people, is absolutely falling flat on its face in the presence of people who will just aggressively assert again and again their right to dominate online, their right to dominate offline, the right of domination of particular groups of people. And I think we, have, we simply don't understand how to um, deal with those kinds of audiences. And the second thing that we don't understand is how insidiously our own language of freedom of speech, our own language of hegemony, our own language about language and discourse has been taken over by these people and is being deployed against liberty, against democracy and against us. And we are, we are floundering as audience researchers. It, there's no point being naive about it. So. I mean, I thought I might say, oh, technology, the dispersal, the fact that it's Snapchat at 2 a.m. in the morning. That's actually so easy to solve. I've done ethnographies with individuals, dispersed individuals, online, offline. People are willing, they are eager to be studied. But getting through to the audience, understanding what motivates that kind of hatred and garbage online is really, really difficult.